morning, everyone. This is Shaitali Bhatt from the European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe based out of Cyprus. As a war between Russia and Ukraine is in its ninth day, an end seems to be distant. ADO has been pondering whether the navies of the two countries and of the NATO nations have an impending role. The French carrier strike group led by the French aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle was anchored in the seas of Cyprus, which made us think. To analyze the situation, we have with us Commodore Ageson, a naval vet uh, veteran and a submariner, who will clear our minds on whether this war will be turning into a naval one soon. Welcome to this show, sir. And to take the discussion forward, we have with us Sangeeta Saxena, editor, Aviation and Defense Universe. Welcome, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, Atali. And uh, I think this is one subject we've been thinking so much about, uh, Commodore AJ. Welcome to the show to give us a background about what is happening. You know, with so much and so many maritime borders in the region, uh, with all the countries in the region, the uh, you know CIS nations, as well as the other parts of Europe, but we still don't see the naval war in the offing. What does it mean? Uh, well, thank you very much, Atali and Sangeeta, for this opportunity. You know, you said, tell us what is happening there. <laughs> it's a, it's a million-dollar question, actually, what's happening in the maritime domain. Because, really speaking, there's so much focus on what's happening in the, on land over there, you know, with the more sort of immediate thing that one is really not sure of uh, what is actually... But I, don't, I personally don't think much is happening in the maritime domain in terms of kinetic effect. There has been a bit. There was an attack on Snake Island. You know, where those 13 uh, soldiers uh, used an expletive to uh, shoo the Russians away when they were asked to surrender. Now, one report said they've been killed. Another report said they've been captured. But uh, bottom line is that that island is now in Russian control. And it's a very small island just being defended by 13 people. But it is very close to Romania. Romania is a NATO country. So to, if NATO were to perhaps uh, initiate some sort of action, this could be a A to AD kind of arrangement over here. You know, the Russians could deploy assets on this island to keep uh, NATO at bay. Right in the beginning, the you know, Russia, Russia always had a Black Sea fleet. In fact, they've shared a lot of uh, water space with Ukraine in the Black Sea because those ports are, give everybody very easy access to warmer waters uh, of the Mediterranean, unlike the other, other uh, fleets that, that Russia has. And so this is all, the Black Sea has always been a bone of contention to a certain extent between these two countries. Uh, Russia has a substantial Black Sea fleet compared to the total strength of the Ukrainian Navy. Ukrainian Navy has no submarines, it has, it barely has 30 odd ships. And I understand, now again, there's no uh, specific information that effect, but I understand slowly Russia was building up its forces here, ships from the other fleets had been coming in. And there, the presence, the Russian naval presence there is much larger than the Black Sea fleet per se. And that is why I think uh, Ukraine requested Turkey to close the Bosphorus uh, under the Montreux Convention. But while Turkey did that and Ukraine thanked them for it, but uh, one feels that it's not really going to be very effective because Turkey put in the caveat that they can't stop Russian ships going back to the base ports, which means they cannot control the Black Sea fleet, can still come and go as they please. Or at least go back if they're out somewhere. As far as NATO is concerned, and there have also been reports that there's been an amphibious attack on uh, Mariupol, which is again unsubstantiated because uh, the belief is that if there's such an such a amphibious assault did take place, how come we never heard about it? There were no injuries, there were no casualties. It couldn't have been so easy that they just walked into a port with an amphibious attack. Similarly, there is a lot of lot of questions on why has Ukraine not used Neptune missiles to Attack the Russian Navy. They've got the Neptune missile. I think Neptune only it's called. Yeah, Neptune. But the contrary view on that is that no, it's just been, they've just sort of, they're not even sure whether it's fully operationalized as yet. Because there is a view in that if they were to take out even one Russian warship in the Black Sea, it would be, it would have a deterrent effect on the Russian Navy's sort of, uh, you know, juggernaut which is prevailing over there. So there are lots of ifs and buts and not really very clear. There have been reports that the initial bombing that took place on the on the uh, on the uh, Ukrainian mainland also included caliber missiles fired by ships from the Black Sea Fleet. So I think it's a little. Uh, personally, I don't think it'll ever, this is ever going to become a naval war. 
perhaps if tomorrow russia wants to control odessa because that's a very very uh, valuable uh, asset that russia could have that that it would be able to do because there is practically no resistance at sea to what the russian navy wants to do so it's never going to be an all out naval war as such whether nato will intervene or not is also a million dollar question i know ships have been redeployed uh, chatali just mentioned that the charles de gaulle group has been uh, redeployed to the med uh, the truman group has been redeployed they were off for an exercise to the north but they've been redeployed hms diamond has been deployed is supposed to sail from portsmouth four she has sailed and four times she has gone back with technical defects so there is some sort of uh, preparedness happening on nato's part but i don't think nato is going to directly intervene in a naval war uh, unless its own uh, allies are threatened which is what the statement they made they made the statement very clear that we will come to the assistance of our allies so ukraine people said indirectly it meant that they're telling ukraine we're not coming to your assistance but that was i don't think what he meant what he meant was if we are threatened we will definitely retaliate and that is more or less a foregone conclusion so i don't know how far this whole naval thing is going to play out what definitely has happened is we, you know uh, the russian navy reportedly sank two merchant ships now two merchant ships means firstly that means you try to convey they had even issued a no time telling all merchant ships to leave the area and go out of the bosphorus which practically means you are creating an exclusion zone and once you create an exclusion zone you are practically blockaded uh, ukraine from anything coming or going from that country uh, trade trade wise and i think that includes and more than trade it, it is energy it is oil it is food uh you know wheat going out from ukraine has been stopped from going out so there are lots of factors from a trade perspective where navy is really coming to play and i read somewhere now again that it, uh, i have not i mean it's it's just a news item that i read that fuel has gone up by seven times in ukraine cost of fuel and uh, inflation is going up and everything is going up over there so and the and the currency has been devalued uh, so it will have a lot of economic uh, the naval effort will have more economic repercussions than uh, uh, kinetic or military repercussions actually in this from what i what it appears at the moment <clears throat> right sir and uh, you know basically continuing from what where you are leaving here is that uh, you know we we feel you know sitting here in india we realize that there's so there's so many seas connecting uh, russia ukraine to the rest of europe now you have the rest of europe free the rest of the seas are free now uh, you know every day every 3 to 4 hours you hear of some more ships from various nations coming and parking themselves so do, don't you think that something uh, you know russia also would have uh, uh, preempted and understood and uh, what would be the fleet like you know because russia russian fleet is supposed to be one of the biggest and what would be their fleet like and where does ukraine stand if it doesn't even have a single submarine see there is absolutely no comparison between what the russian navy is and what the ukrainian navy is uh, the russian navy's black sea fleet alone is far superior to anything the ukrainian navy has submarines is one aspect of it even in terms of the quality of ships the type of ships they you know russia has got cruisers and frigates and patrol ships in the black sea fleet Uh, the slava class cruiser is flagship over there which carried out that attack on the island so there is no com- naval comparison so as far as the maritime thing goes russia is practically uh, there's no going to challenge russia i mean ukraine cannot challenge russia uh, in the maritime domain at all except but maybe launch a missile together, but if everybody comes together everybody is with ukraine suddenly you realize if, that everybody comes together everybody is ukraine, ukraine but i think i think putin is quite quite confident that uh nato forces are not going to come in and directly get involved in the in the shooting war i don't think that's going to happen and i don't think they will unless like i said romania or poland or someone feels threatened by something they do or some untoward incident happens which escalates the whole thing but i don't think a conscious thing will be decision will be there to defeat the russian navy in the black sea for ukraine's sake i don't see that i don't think that's going to happen because you know when it, when it reaches a naval war of that that proportion the missiles are being fired by ships the whole the whole scenario changes uh it's one thing shooting across the borders with you know with, with troops it's another thing sinking warships and and going in. and then you know nato will be in it too deep to be able to extricate itself <clears throat> and frankly speaking at the end of the day uh it may get some it may get some you know it may get an edge in uh, 
in the Black Sea area or in that in the Mediterranean or whatever, give some assistance to Ukraine. But it will do a lot of damage overall to the entire security uh, scenario in, that, in the Russia-Europe relationship, the Russia-America relationship. I know, know it's strained, but it, it has not reached those Cold War proportions where it was a you know a, a, a trigger away from a nuclear holocaust, notwithstanding the fact that Putin has alerted his nuclear forces. But that everyone is saying is just a rule. I mean, nobody is really convinced to do anything. But but uh, the other side is that Macron today itself has said that this is not the last you're seeing of it. After the last talk with Putin, he expects things to get a lot worse. So we don't know. And you know what is driving Putin? What is his motivation for taking this? And how far is he going to take it? It's all still in the state of conjecture. But in the immediate thing, the NATO forces will be ready. They'll be standing by. But I doubt that they will get into a direct naval conflict with Russia just over Ukraine. <clears throat> At this point, uh, I don't you, think it's going to happen. Uh, yes, and uh, one thing, you know, you are you are a, you are a strategist, and wanted to understand one thing from you that uh, out of the fifteen CIS nations, do you see some of them who would be uh, favoring Ukraine and who also have a good naval presence? So, Sangeeta, if you see the fifteen republics that constituted the USSR, five of them are the Central Asian republics, so they're out of the picture. Practically, they're landlocked in any case they're on the other side of, of Russia. So they are not involved in this conflict at all and wouldn't like to get involved either. Then we have the three Baltic republics, uh, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia. They are very much now part of the Western fold. So they will pretty much do whatever the West does. They will not be taking any independent action uh, uh, you know, on their own. That leaves, basically, you end up again with just the three Belarus, Ukraine and, uh, sorry, yeah, Belarus, Ukraine and Russia which really formed the core of the, of the former Soviet Union. And Belarus is very much on Russia's side, or at least uh, has said nothing in favor of Ukraine. So Ukraine, from that perspective, can't expect much help. Countries may have the sympathies with it, but they don't have either the military capacity or the economic capacity to challenge Russia in coming to Ukraine's aid. So I don't see any maritime uh, effort happening from the CIS, the old uh, CIS republics, on supporting uh, Ukraine maritime effort in this war. In fact, it's still uh, you know what. No matter how small your navy might be, some resistance should be there from the uh, uh, on the maritime front. We are seeing no resistance at all from uh, the Ukrainians of any kind in the maritime domain. So I wonder, I wonder what, how weak are they? Are they not ready? Were they never ready? Because you know, just last year. Or was it year before last? They placed a large order for patrol vessels and a few other vessels with, uh, with Britain. Those ships have not even been delivered as yet. So uh, I'm not sure that they what their actually their constraints are. And this I think is uh, uh, is something that other maritime uh, in the maritime domain people are asking this question that some form of resistance should have been there. There's been absolutely zero resistance to the Russian presence in the in the Black Sea. Right, sir. And uh, so we have so many of these maritime organizations like Quad. And uh, India is, with this abstinence of vote, has uh, made clear that, uh, you know, it, it's trying to balance a relationship. Now, does that uh, influence our maritime relationships with the rest of the world and with the friendly nations apart from Russia? See, I don't think at the moment, at the moment, I think the world is taking a very sort of uh, understanding India's predicament, frankly speaking. They understand our relationship with Russia. America has been very muted in its uh, reactions. Uh, Australia was a little upset. Japan also made a little noises here and there. Uh, the Quad meeting only India did not uh, mention Russia, which, was, which did not go down very well with them. But notwithstanding that, I think they understand our compulsions. Uh, they even they've even understood why we abstained because they probably felt we had really had no choice. But whether this will this sort of patience will continue if uh, the operation escalates or if things go from bad to worse, will India's abstinence or walking the middle path be acceptable to the West or not is a major is a question. And if you really look at even the Quad meetings and all, while they have all spoken of what's happening in the Ukraine, but their concern still remains China. You know, everyone is worried about. <coughs> How will this play out as far as China is concerned, this conflict? They are not talking about how is it going to play out for Russia and Ukraine. Everyone is talking about how is it going to play out in the Indo-Pacific. Will, will this embolden China to take Taiwan? 
uh, China is watching very carefully. So uh, the Indo-Pacific attention is still on the Indo-Pacific itself, really speaking. And if you really look at any of the Indo-Pacific navies, none of them have the capacity to go and operate in the Mediterranean or provide support to any, any physical support uh, to Ukraine other than the US Navy. <clears throat> Yes, sir, absolutely. And uh, sir, uh, before we leave, uh, one last question that, uh, you know, once uh, everything becomes okay, we are hoping that the war comes to an end. Post that, what will, how do you see the world order as far as maritime is concerned? You see, Russia, I'll be, uh, you know, if you really look at Russia, what Russia is doing today is not entirely unexpected. You know, whenever I have attended conferences in the West, where, you know, we, we, are, also, we are also caught up in the Indo-Pacific and China, and of course, China is no doubt a big threat to all of us, and the Americans are generally worried about China. I don't think they're as worried about Russia as they're worried about what China is going to do. Because let's face it, I still don't think Russia is a big power in that sense of the term that it can challenge the US or challenge the world order in terms of becoming like the Soviet Union. Because even the present Russian uh, edifice is on, not on such a strong economic footing. You know, okay, they've got their oil and their gas, but that's about all they've got. And uh, if you really look at the Amer Russian economy for a country of that size, it's the 11th largest economy in the world, which means that it's not such a strong economy as, as, they would as Mr. Putin would have us believe. So it didn't collapse for the same reason. They just could not support that military structure with the, because the edifice had become so hollow. So if perhaps Putin needs to take an objective view internally also and uh, and assess how far can he go before his own country starts feeling the pain. And like I've said, if you want to hit these people with sanctions, you have, till the average Russian doesn't get hurt by these sanctions, Putin will continue doing what he's doing. It's only when the average Russian starts getting hurt by these sanctions, will he start questioning, why is he in this position? Who has led him to the state where he's now being, uh, you know, he's having to pay for somebody else's uh, uh, follies. So if really you want to get put in, you have to hit him where it hurts. And that is internally. Because externally, he'll keep, he'll keep uh, sh uh, showing his strength. After all, he has got 600 billion foreign exchange reserves. So the sanctions aren't going to hit him immediately. It'll take time before these sanctions really start uh, causing grief within the country or to the people. So I think that is important. Now, whether the West has the stamina to do that is a different question altogether. Because... Uh, you know, with the Euro's relationship with Russia, Germany, even these countries are going to get affected. Now, whether they have the appetite to absorb that kind of pain to themselves in trying to cause pain to Putin is a different is a question that only they can answer at this point of time. So right. it's going to be. <clears throat> but I think I personally think uh, the only way to uh, to control or get Putin to stand down and you know look at things realistically is to make sure the average Russian also feels the pinch of sanctions. Otherwise, it's, it's, it won't make any difference. Because at the end of the day, I mean, this is what, you know, we were in the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union collapsed. I mean, it was collapsing. I wasn't there when it collapsed, but I was there till the end of 88 and 89, the wall came down. And we had seen the change. We, were, we had also been there in 82 and we'd been there in 85 and 86. We'd seen the height of the Cold War, the Brezhnev-Nixon standoff. Then we saw Gorbachev coming in and bringing in Perestroika and Glasnost. And then we saw this collapse happening with Yeltsin and all being so weak. Now, a person like Putin, who belonged to the hardcore KGB. Now, KGB was the most powerful organization in the most powerful country in the world, or they, they believed so. For them to stomach the sort of fall that happened and the humiliation they faced after that was something that hit them very hard. And it did not hit the KGB only very hard, it hit the average Russian very hard. He just could not reconcile to the fact that from being a superpower today is nothing. So inherently, every Russian wants that my country should be powerful again. And Putin gave them that uh, hope that he is the guy who can make them powerful again. And so they rallied around him. But they have also realized now to a large extent that it's not really worked out as well as they would have liked it to. And it could cause them also grief. So let's see how it plays out. But uh, right. in the image... I, I think you're right. I think you're right in what you're saying. And, uh, uh, you know, I we're just waiting and hoping that the next time we meet we might have something more to talk about on the maritime front, more on the strategic front. But what you've put across is uh, really perfect because that is what an audience needs to understand that uh, it's not, which is, you know, he's not being hit where he should be hit. So if he's, uh, you know, if he doesn't get hit there, then things continue. 
as they are continuing. But we only hope and pray that the war comes to an end. And because war has not helped anybody here. So thank you yeah. very much, Commodore AJ, for coming here and, you know, taking our time from a very heavy schedule. We know you are at the moment. And I'm taking <laughs> back uh, both of us to uh, Cyprus, where Chatali is waiting for us. Uh, thank you so much, Sangeeta. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much. It was a pleasure. Yes, uh, we did a story yesterday about the navies, which are going to uh, change the whole warfare, I mean, the whole course. And your inputs here definitely mean a lot to us. It is going to give us more uh, food for thought to write more, of course, and research more on this. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks for your time. And uh, hope the war doesn't escalate anymore. The situations come to control soon. <clears throat> hope for the best. Thank you and have a nice evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Jatali. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Jatali. Thank you. Thank you.